I'm Frank Sanchez, Chair of the Preservation League of New York State. I'm joined on the screen by Suzanne Quarry, my fellow board member at the League and co-chair of the Excelsior Society, and tonight's presenters, Julie Seeley and Alelia Bundles. I'd like to welcome you all to the League's second webinar, being presented, being presented exclusively for the League's Excelsior Society members and specially invited guests. The purpose of these seminars is to explore various aspects of heritage preservation. Tonight, we're going to talk about protecting and preserving underrepresented heritage, a topic whose importance was heavily underscored by yesterday's events in Washington, DC. The past two decades have seen a shift from strictly architectural preservation to a more inclusive focus on preserving the places and stories associated with non-dominant populations, both in the United States and abroad. For example, underrepresented heritage is one of the three strategic initiatives of the World Monuments Fund. At the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Brent Legs, who I believe is joining us tonight, has created an entire initiative devoted to preserving African-American heritage. And at the League, in the past two years, we have listed Rap Road, a 19th century African-American community in Gilderland, Sands, which is three connected mid 20th century African-American vacation communities in Sag Harbor, and the Elmhurst Burial Ground, a forgotten 19th century African-American cemetery in Queens on the seven to save list. And we're advocating, advocating actively for the protection of all three of these places. I feel very privileged personally to be involved with these initiatives at all three organizations. It's a great, great honor for me. This evening's conversation turns to the preservation of the homes of two remarkable 20th, early 20th century African-American entrepreneurs, Nathan Seeley and Madam C.J. Walker, as told by Mr. Seeley's granddaughter, Julie Seeley, and Madam Walker's great-granddaughter, Alelia Bundles. Each of these women has led the effort to preserve their family homes. And now I'm delighted to introduce Suzanne Clary uh, to introduce them and move on to our program. As many of you know, Suzanne and board member Thomas Jane serve as co-chairs of the Heritage Society. In addition to her involvement with the League, Suzanne is president of the Jay Heritage Center in Rye. There, she has overseen both an ambitious restoration of the National Historic Landmark Home of Founding Father John Jay and the development of an outstanding interpretation of the Jay family and the enslaved and freed African-American men and women who lived, worked, and are buried at the site. Suzanne. Thank you, Frank. And I'm very excited to be part of this uh, presentation tonight. So we have a real treat. Uh, uh, Alelia and Julie are guardians, uh, essentially, of two very special architectural wonders in Westchester County. The physical preservation of their family homes has been amplified by their own beautifully written narratives. At the end of this program, we're going to sh share links to their books. Hopefully, you'll purchase them and enjoy them. Um, but what they've written and uh, taken of their personal recollections um, has already inspired others to preserve homes, neighborhoods, um, and, and personal oral histories that make our shared American heritage truly authentic. Uh, tonight, they will share their individual journeys uh, to bring us to uh, the 1920s and 30s um, when their ancestors had dreams and visions of, of creating um, th these incredible structures. Um, and what can we learn? But let's think about what we can learn from their rewards and challenges and what advice um, they can offer to stewards or would-be preservationists who are listening or may hear our recorded uh, program later. 
Uh, let me tell you a little bit about both of them. Alalia is a Columbia University trustee and past chairman of the National Archives Foundation. She's also an award-winning journalist, author, and founder of the Madam Walker Family Archives, which is named after her great-great-grandmother, a laundress turned millionaire who commissioned the stunning mansion in Irvington, New York, known as Villa Loaro. A former network television news executive and producer, Alalia has appeared on radio and TV and as a featured speaker at numerous events. Uh, but tonight we will, are going to hear from her about how her great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother wanted a place to relax, like a lot of us, garden and entertain her friends. Madam Walker also wanted to make a statement. And what you'll hear is uh, that it was no accident that she purchased four and a half acres on uh, Irvington on Hudson, uh, not far from Jay Gould's Lindhurst and John D. Rockefeller's Kaikut. Cut. Uh, Alalia will share with us the wonderful history of Illawarro from its beginnings um, in 1918 to today. You can tell us what's going on there today. Um, the house is a national historic landmark and also one of 13 sites on Westchester County's African American Heritage Trail. So it's very special. Uh, Julie, uh, Julie Seeley's early uh, writing career focused on developing educational health materials for women. In 2010, she began a second very successful career writing about the legacy of her grandfather, Nathan T. Seeley Sr., and the famous skinny house, which is much beloved in Mimarinic, um, which was built on a narrow lot during the Great Depression. Julie's screenplay, Skinny House, was shortlisted at the 2011 Gotham Screen International Film Festival. At a mere 10 feet wide, Nathan Seeley's Skinny House is a treasure in the Sound Shore neighborhood. It's, it's so familiar to people. In fact, there's a wonderful mural that went up to, to, um, to share it with people more broadly uh, in the neighborhood. And Nathan Seeley was one of New York's first African-American builders. Uh, he erected the house in 1932, and this unique home is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it has quite a tale to tell. Its story is one of ingenuity, skill, and how it provided a warm and welcoming home for Nathan Seeley and his family during some very hard times. In an era of teardowns and development threats, the survival of this small little house, this gem of a building is truly a miracle, but it's also a testament to the power of the stories behind it. And that's really what tonight's program is about, preserving the, the bones, but also the stories. So I'm gonna uh, share a few housekeeping notes with you tonight. Uh, the format for our evening is uh, Alalia and Julie will each uh, share some wonderful slides and stories for about five minutes each. Then we will have a 30 minute discussion followed by 10 minutes of Q and A from all of you. If you'd like to ask a question uh, during the Q and A, you may raise your hand by clicking on the icon labeled participants at the bottom center of your screen then find and click on your name on the list of participants. Click the button labeled, raise your hand. Uh, your digital hand is now raised and I will call on you for questions. And uh, Frank is gonna be helping me also field questions. Um, if we're not able to get to all the questions, type them into the Q&A box anyway at the bottom of your screen. We will make sure that Alalia and Julie see your questions and we'll follow up with you. We can email you uh, later. Uh, we are recording this program tonight, so it'll be available for future viewing. And um, without further ado, we're going to start uh, with um, uh, uh, with Julie. I'm uh, sorry, Alalia, <laughs> and and hear about uh, Villa Loire. Okay. Suzanne, thank you so much, um, and to the Excelsior Society. It's really always fun to share Madam Walker's story, and I have to say a special thank you to Frank whom I've known for, I don't know, close to 30 years. And that just shows you, while I am the one who gets to tell the story and write the biography, there are so many people who have made it possible for Villa Loaro to be preserved. And some people are on the call uh, to, on the show tonight, Marilyn Woodhill, who has been a, who's a, a member emeritus of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and Steve Tilley and Stephanie Reinhardt, who are involved in the current a restoration of the house. Mark Delassi, who is with Indiana Landmarks, I saw him in the in the list. And I haven't seen Brent Legs's name yet, but Frank mentioned him. But there are many people, including 
the uh, the former owners and the current owners of the house. So as I say, I'm just the one who gets to tell the story. Uh, but Madam C.J. Walker, who you see on the screen, is my great great grandmother. She was born in Delta, Louisiana, in 1867. The first child in her family to be born into freedom. Um, was a washerwoman until she was 38. But by the time she died at Villa Luaro in May of 1919, she had become a millionaire had founded the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company. C.J. was her third husband, C.J. Walker, and then uh, provided employment for thousands of African-American women and used a lot of the profits from the company to be a philanthropist who contributed to black schools and colleges and organizations and was also a political activist who supported the anti-lynching movement. Her daughter, Alelia Walker, who you see in the next slide, um, was born in 1885 in Louisiana and died in Harlem uh, in 1931. And she actually lived in the house longer than her mother and was known for her great parties. They were great Gatsby-esque type parties. Um, and I'm almost finished with the biography about Alelia Walker, but she was very much a patron of the arts and a key figure of the Harlem Renaissance. In the next slide is their townhouse in um, Harlem. They had founded the company in Denver, lived in Pittsburgh for a while, then Indianapolis, Madam Walker moved there in 1910. And Alelia Walker was operating the Pence of the Pittsburgh office. But she, Harlem was part of her territory. And in 1913, she persuaded her mother that they needed to have a presence in Harlem. And they hired Bertner Tandy, who you see here, uh, in the middle in this slide, he was the first licensed black architect uh, in New York. And he, the, Madam Walker was his wealthiest client. So they built, this, bought this property on 136th Street, first a single townhouse, remodeled it into a double townhouse. And that was the home and the Walker Beauty School, Walker Beauty Salon. And then Madam Walker herself, we would go to the next slide, moved, in, moved to New York, moved her residence to New York in 1916 though the company stayed headquartered in Indianapolis. And I'd say, I often joke that that beautiful townhouse was not big enough for two women. Uh, so Madam Walker commissioned Bertner Tandy to build her Villa Lawaro, named after her daughter, L.E. Lelia W.A. Walker, R.O. Robinson, her third husband, uh, suggest, the name was suggested by Enrico Caruso who, because both women loved opera and knew Enrico Caruso. Madam Walker moved into the house in May of 1918. Um, she intentionally, as Suzanne said, built her house so you could see it from Broadway. It's at 67 North Broadway in Irvington to make a statement. She had her opening party there in August of 1918. And then we'll see the next slide. Um, this is on the terrace. This is actually 1924, but it just gives you an idea that what she was trying to do was create a place that would be a comfortable, welcoming place for African-Americans both to socialize and to talk about the political issues of the day. She loved gardening. I have a wonderful letter where she talks about putting on her overalls and, and spending time in the garden because remember she had been on the cot in the cotton plantations uh, of Louisiana. And then the next slide, I, this is a, a, an aerial at winter time at Villa Luaro. It just reminds me that she spent Christmas of December uh, 1918 in Villa Luaro, but unfortunately was in the house less than uh, just just about a year and died in May of 1918. And then the final slide is Alelia Walker in the music room with the gold trimmed piano. Madam Walker died in 1919. Alelia Walker lived until 1931, but entertained people. I interviewed Alberta Hunter, the great blues singer who many of you know. Uh, whose name you know, and she talked about spending weekends there for parties and playing the estate organ that was there. But those are just a few highlights about uh, Madam Walker and Alelia Walker, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Julie. <laughs> okay, hey, Julie. Suzanne? We're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Around the same decade and about less than 20 miles from the Grand Villa Luaro was my grandfather, uh, Nathan T. Seeley. And my story takes place in Mimarinic, New York, 
I grew up in Baltimore, but I spent much of my childhood since toddler age until I think I was in medical school visiting my grandmother on 175 Grand Street in Mamaroneck. And Mamaroneck was always a place that I was fascinated with because then translation from many ancestors um, is the place where the sweet waters fall into the sea. There's just something so magical and mystical about that uh, wonderful translation. And for me, it just rings the drums of the native uh, Indians in that area. And I just love Mamaroneck. Next slide, please. Well, for me, I kind of fell into the story. I always knew that I would write about my family. My grandfather is Nathan T. Seeley, the young 20-something year old with the uh, cap there. Uh, he was ambidextrous. He was a carpenter. Uh, he later went on to night school to learn how to draft blueprints. And he and his brother Willard Seely, in late in about 1915, started to buy tracts of land in the village of Mamaroneck. They wanted to build houses for those African Americans coming up from the South who were trying to escape racism. The Lady in the middle there is my grandmother, Lillian Seely. And you can tell this is a 1920s photograph. Why? Because she is a woman who has a cigarette in her hand and she's standing in front of her regular size home on Grand Street built my, by my grandfather as well. The top picture is of my aunt Shug, Aunt Lillian, and she wanted to be an opera star. She had a beautiful soprano voice and she was later mentored by a French a teacher named Mademoiselle Milda Pelea Pate. And that is a famous French uh, painter uh, portrait behind her. Um, and I learned a lot of this by doing the research on my aunt Shug. My father, of course, I knew the best. He grew up in the Maronick and at the age of 10, uh, moved to the skinny house after my grandfather lost his business and his regular size house, which you see there. So for him, moving from a regular size house to a 10 foot wide, three story, single family home was quite traumatic. And so I sought to understand his perspective about that transition in his life. And I wanted to get to know the other characters. My grandfather was the only person I did not meet. I knew my grandmother and my aunt very well. Next slide, please. Well, when I, my son was in third grade and it was grandparents day and I was chosen to go to the class and speak about my grandfather. So I went down in the basement and pulled out a box of memorabilia that my aunt Sugar had given me. And I found the blueprint of the skinny house. I was thrilled, won't the third graders love to see this? Well, at the bottom of the box was this very old strange colored paper. And I read it for the first time um, in, I think, late 1990s. And it was entitled Homes for Colored People. And the first paragraph blew me away. It was entitled The Colored Man's Home. Every colored man needs a home. That statement does not require proof. It is the dearest wish of every individual of every color or race to have a clean, decent place in which to house his family in which to bring up his children in peace and comfort. And when I read that paragraph, I realized that I knew nothing about my grandfather. This was the grandfather who was an entrepreneur. This was a grandfather who wanted to give back uh, to his community because he realized there was a dearth of affordable housing for African-Americans coming up from the South. And so he and his brother Willard decided, why not? If we're not gonna do it now, when? This is the 1920s five. Um, there's a Harlem Renaissance going on. There's a lot of inspiration. The war is over. Uh, it's peacetime. There's available jobs for African-Americans coming up from the South. Why not? So I was determined at some point to write about my grandfather. Next slide, please. 
And in that research, which took several years, I learned certainly about all the historical events going on, but I also found additional pictures that thank goodness my aunt Shug had labeled. And I could see that my grandfather was actively building houses with his investors and with his brother Willard. And these are some of the photographs around uh, the village of Amerinik. Yes, the skinny house is still standing, um, having been built in 1932. It has gone through trials and tribulations, but it's always been a home designed for a family and is in private ownership now for a family. So I'm very, very proud of that. The house next door to the skinny house and where my grandmother um, is standing still is sound as well and is a family home. The others you see here are not standing, but, um, and I think there were a few others that we were not able uh, to find as well. But I'm very proud to have some of these black and white uh, photographs about uh, my grandfather's business. Next slide. And I wanted to show you, you this photograph so you can get a perspective of the size of the Sealy family regular house as it looks today and the skinny house as it looks today. Uh, my grandfather was determined that despite um, his uh, having lost a regular size house, he was going to build the, the best darn skinny house there was. And so even though he used salvaged materials, the skinny house has good bones and is still um, strong. Next slide. As you can see from the street, it looks like a very simple house, but my grandfather, I think literally thought outside the box. Some would say a Lego building block box, but he used uh, salvage materials of varying sizes to let the sun shine in. He did a lot of very unique uh, features to make it comfortable and convenient for his family. And um, I think he just had a wonderful imagination despite all the uh, darkness around him uh, that all of America was experiencing. He still, his imagination was still strong and he was saying, we've got to get through this and I'll do it the best way I can. Next slide. As you can see, these are more recent pictures, but it is a home for a family. You can see the different levels of the walls, the ceiling and the windows, and it goes straight back to the kitchen. Next slide. You can also see the, uh, some of the original cabinets in the kitchen and uh, the beautiful bones of the house. Next slide. And also, this is looking towards the front door where when I was growing up, there were always some lace kitchen, uh, some lace curtains hanging up there. And uh, the little compartment in the ceiling was what my father and grandfather called a library, where my grandfather kept his workbooks. And of course, my father went up there to do secret things, he says. And next slide. And here you can see the spiral, one of a three spiral staircase. And for me, I always imagined that my grandfather had to measure my grandmother's feet going up their stairs. Um, she never once fell down their stairs, although she lived there until she was in her 80s. Next slide, please. And that's my story. Um, similar to Alelia's story, it's about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Thank you both. So uh, this is the conversation part of our, our program. And Frank and I both have a, a lot of questions for you. And uh, again, the, the audience will be able to ask questions at the end of our conversation. But just to start off, you know, we were preparing for this program and um, we asked you, you know, what were the most perilous times that you could remember, you know, during the, you know, the, the efforts to save um, each of these structures, you know, what memories you have of, of those moments, you know, maybe the threat of a wrecking ball or anything else really, um, you know, worried you and had you had you um, rallying forces. So for Villa Loire, the Villa Loire was sold in the early 30s after Alilia Walker died. The estate was going through hard times. So I did not really ever go to Villa Loire until 
the 1980s. I happened to have been in New York for a conference at the Terrytown Center. I knocked on the door with a friend of mine. I walked over there and it was still owned by an organization called Companions of the Forest. They were very reluctant for me to see anything. Eventually I did get inside a few years later. The house was then sold to Ingo Appel who owned it for a while. He was struggling to figure out how to restore it. Then uh, it was owned by Harold and Helena Doley and it's now owned by a foundation that was created by the family of Richelieu Dennis who was the founder of Sundial Brands. So I've not personally been involved in the paying for things and the mortgages and all of that, but in telling the story. And it did go through moments when it wasn't clear what was going to happen with the house, but the private owners have really been great stewards and have done a great job in restoration. I think you and I met during one of those unclear moments. Yes, exactly, exactly right, Frank. <laughs> Frank has Frank knows the journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, you know, I realized that um, you know the skinny house is mainly made of wood and timber, and so over time, the time is not a friend to a house built um, out of mainly wood and timber. Um, so I think on early 2015s, there was an, a termite infestation that the then owner discovered when she was doing some renovations in the house. So that certainly put some pressure on me to um, write more about the house, get this book done. It took me several years, but I have always felt strongly to work with whoever owns the house uh, to work together to preserve it. Um, in anything that we can do, whether that is, um, you know, just staying close by to um, talk about renovations or finding people um, who will sh listen to the story. So regardless of who owns this house, I really feel that it remains in, in the Sealy legacy family. And with that becomes responsibility. And I, I will always pledge to help whoever the owner is to uh, preserve the home. So one, one thing that, that I'm thinking about is that both of these houses, interestingly, have wound up being privately owned. So they are the, the public does not come into these places. The public sees them if they happen to pass by. And you know, an option for homes, this is what happened to the J house, is that they become a museum. But there's very few of these properties that actually can wind up being museums. Most of them wind up privately owned. So buildings obviously can't speak, but there's a great value in these two houses, the story of these two houses and the people who lived in them and built them for the African-American community. So now the two of you have written books about them, but I don't know how many, you know, how broad you can make the distribution of any book. And so how do you both feel is the best way to get the stories of these places out? Um, what, yeah, I can, I can see there's a sign in front of the skinny house. I don't know if there's anything on that sign that leads you to be able to find out more about it. There isn't a sign in front of Villa Luaro so what ideas do you have uh, to bring these stories to the African-American community in particular for whom it can be very inspirational? So, well, there, there actually is a marker um, in front of Villa Luar, but you're <laughs> right, there's a big fence around it. Um, people can, but people find out about that house. You know, I, I think once a month I get a, an email from somebody asking if they can have a wedding, a wedding in the house. So it, it pops up in photo shoots and people can walk by or jog by in the back because it's along the aqueduct. So people can see it from, from the back of the house. But I think that um, the, the work that Brent Legs is doing with the National Trust African-American Historic and Cultural Preservation Action Fund uh, is raising awareness uh, about this. And it really, as you say, it really is the stories. What, one of the things Frank did quickly is that when I first met you, um, the trust was actually considering whether it was going to bring 
Villa Lawaro in. But at that point, it was like there was no endowment to go with it. And you told me at the time, house museums are really hard. <laughs> and so, it sounds like Frank. It sounds right. like Frank. And, and he was right. But but the good I think the good news now is that people are people are aware of the importance of telling these stories and having these tangible examples of the history of women and of people of color. And I would say that uh, with the Skinny House, um, although it, it left our family in late 1980s, uh, the owners, uh, there's only been two um, after my grandmother's uh, death, they're part of the community and the local community has always embraced the Skinny House from uh, the Santangelo family, the, the neighbors next door to the Mamaroneck Historical Society. Um, it the house has always been embraced. Uh, with the book, um, I wanted to share the story of the people who live there. And so th for me, that can't be separated from the wonderful story of, you know, uh, Madam C.J. Walker and the wonderful story of Nathan Seeley. Um, who had aspirations to be an architect, I'm sure, as he signed the blueprint, acting as architect, acting as um, designer and acting as builder. Um, and so sharing these, these ancestor inspirations is a way to you know, preserve the legacy as well. And I must say, uh, anyone can walk down Grand Street and thankfully the uh, private owner has allowed me to put information at the end of her driveway um, because she realizes the importance of this history. And um, so I feel very, very blessed to have that support. So, so Julie, you mentioned uh, the Historical Society and Alalia mentioned Brent Legs. I mean, there, there's definitely a tight knit preservation you know, community. Can you talk a little bit about more about that and um, uh, and your interaction with with other um, you know the historical societies or or even other individuals who are trying to do something similar to what's been done with each of the of the buildings you know in your in your experience. Well, I will say that the um, Skinny House has had a um, quite a journey to come from a, a house that was kind of funny and made fun of in the community. Um, but by 1978, a local uh, historian, um, uh, Grace Huntley Pugh, uh, went to the local Mamaroneck uh, Landsmark Committee and said, you know, this is, this is a story, this needs to be preserved. Um, later in 1991, Westchester County uh, made it a historical landmark. And in 2015, we made application for the National Registry of Historic Places. So every place, has a journey. And so all along, you know, um, preservation has to be encouraged and, and built upon. So I'm very happy that, you know, I've written the book and that I have a foundation of a story that can go along with the preservation journey, which will have to continue. But I'm very, very grateful for um, the early um, events of the local village of Mamaroneck to realize, hmm, this is not just a funny looking house. This is, there's a story here. And I had to step up and, and share the story of Nathan. Um, and I think that that's what my goal was. So, so like Julie, I have really been um, just really heartened by how much the village of Irvington and Westchester Historical Society, Irvington Historical Society have really embraced having Madam Walker as part of the story they tell uh, of the village. It's, it is very important to, um, you know, to have that kind of support. And in, interestingly with Madam Walker, there are two National Historic Landmarks. Uh, Villa Loire is also a National Trust, National Treasure, but it's also a National Historic Landmark. And in Indianapolis, the Madam Walker Legacy Center, the block long flat iron building that was built as the headquarters for the Walker Company, also as a National Historic Landmark and the Indiana Historical Society and Indiana Landmarks of the Preservation Society have embraced the legacy. We are supported also with the Indiana Historical Society because we were able to donate Madam Walker's papers to the Indiana Historical Society in the early 80s. There's currently a major exhibit about Madam Walker that takes 
some of the 40,000 documents that are there. But being able to have that documentation for the story helps it to come alive to other people. One thing I don't have, Julie, is the blueprints. We have searched and searched and searched. Oh. We cannot find the blueprints. You can't find the blueprints for that house? Right, I know. Frank, if somebody, if, you know, in the um, in Westchester uh, municipal area can find it, we would love it, but we haven't been able to find them. Holy moly, that's really hard to believe. And it's so amazing, uh, Julie, that you've got the blueprints for the other half. I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of, a little house like the skinny houses where you would expect that the blueprints would disappear or they didn't occur. Um, you have a very unusual situation because your grandfather knew how to draw and could draw that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I had an Aunt Shook who was an executive secretary. <laughs> so she labeled everything. That's right. <laughs> everything. Uh, you know, so for I'm very grateful for that. But that's pretty shocking about Vertner Tandy's drawings because you'd think they'd be at Avery or something like that. Right. His, there's very little, it's really sad because he was such a major figure, but there's very little documentation. There's a dissertation that someone wrote about him about 40 years ago. Uh, and as I say, I know Steve Tilly is on and I know Steve would love to find those those blueprints. Yeah, I bet he would. <laughs> so I have, I have a follow up question on that one. Um, about local historical societies and and their connection to historic places in their communities. So I think the story has changed a lot. Uh, back when I did my book on Westchester, which is ages ago in 1976, um, local historical societies, I don't think were hugely involved with anything that had to do with underrepresented heritage. I think that's changed a lot now. Um, you know, the greatest value of these places, though, I think comes to the communities in which they sit. So the skinny house is really important um, to the village of Mamaroneck. And I think that Villa Luaro, while it's more known nationally, is really important for people who live in Irvington. So I'm wondering if the historical societies who I, I think really do value these places aren't the best connection um, to the local public to make sure that they're aware of them. And so um, my question is, how, how do you think school kids in either of your communities find out about these places? Is it through the schools? Is it through the historical societies? What's your guess or what's your knowledge about that? Well, well, uh, certainly um, for the village of Mamaroneck, again, the skinny house has been part of the school, schools, elementary schools, and because they used to write letters to the skinny house lady. Ah. <laughs> so it was a prime subject for elementary schools um, about you know local history. Um, that's one of the things I'd like to explore. Um, you know, legacy and preservation um, needs to move on to another generation and another generation and another generation. So I thought that my grandfather's story would be a great um, a foundation for a screenplay or a Broadway play or a book or artwork. And, you know, it doesn't make any difference, I guess, the, the way we, we share the story, as long as we share the story. And I think in different forms and artistic perspectives is a great way to, to um, encourage the new generation. And that's the way I brought on uh, my millennial son, who is a technical guy and uh, is working on films. You know, there are, within Irvington, um, the village of Irvington has been trying to make sure that, that kids know about it. It's, and there are materials that we could be creating. I've written a children's book about Madam Walker, not specifically about, uh, about Villa Luaro, but I think it's easy to uh, create materials, especially now, you know, I would be happy to talk to kids on Zoom. Uh, about about the house, so it, it, that that I would really welcome. And the another thing that I do um, 
National History Day, people who have kids who are junior high school age know about this, but I help kids every year. And every now and then I will get a, a query from somebody in Westchester County who's doing something on Madam Walker. But Frank, you're right. If you know, trying to be able to share this with the next generation is important. And part of that is because so much of the history of people of color has been erased, whether it's the cre in inner cities, the building of highways that destroyed black neighborhoods or built medical schools or built college campuses or whatever, that there's not a, you know, the evidence, the tangible evidence of these people who live there. So to the degree that historical societies um, and, and landmark societies can help to tell the story, whatever buildings they have can be used to expand upon telling the history of a community. I have to uh, make sure I, I give a, a shout out to some people who may be listening to this program from the African American Advisory Board, because Frank, you just asked the perfect question and Alalia and Julie, you also said just the right things. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, the African American Advisory Board uh, not only revised their brochure for the 13 sites on the African American Heritage Trail, um, but they also digitized it. So it would be online so people could find these sites. And of the discussions that we, we had as a, as a committee, there's also uh, for the 400th commemoration last year, there was a special committee put together to look at all of the different um, cities, villages, hamlets in Westchester County and say, can't we add more sites? Why just 13? There's so many more in Westchester County. And we don't necessarily even have to put a plaque in front of all of them, as Frank was saying, maybe it is just some kind of a digital access point for school children, for visitors, for people outside of the cities that these sites are in. And the Skinny House, you know, definitely came up. It's like, okay, we've got 13. Why isn't Skinny House 14? And, and how do we make, um, you know, uh, the, 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 um, this other house, you know, 15, 16, that sort of thing. So I, I do want to give credit to Barbara Edwards, who's the, the chair of the African American Advisory Board and her committee members and board members who, who are actively thinking about that. And I know they would they would love to talk to you, Alalia <laughs> and Julie. So, you know, when Frank said 1976 for his book, that was right around the time when I think historical societies really were getting the message that they needed to be more inclusive. So mm -hmm. I have, there, definitely you have seen um, the collection, the sort of acquisition of papers and making sure that they're really telling the full story of American history. I mean, I know this is a group that doesn't need to be convinced, but it is important to, to tell a wider picture just other than extremely wealthy white people. <laughs> now I've got, an, I've got an architecture question for the two of you. Um, obviously at Villa Luaro, the idiom is classical and that's what most of the big shots of the time who had a lot of money were using uh, or telling their architects to use uh, in the design of their houses. I'm looking at all the detail that's on the skinny house. I'm looking at the eaves, the little returns. I'm, I'm looking at the window placement, which you mentioned before. I'm looking at the way that the roofs intersect. Where do you suppose Nathan Seeley came up with that from? Well, I, my grandfather was a very practical man, very practical. And um, he decided, I think it was uh, practicality and pride as well. You think that he had a regular sized home, which is state of the art at the time, you know, indoor plumbing, you know, central heating. He was very proud of the house that he designed for his, his wife. You mean the one um, that's up front? That, that's exactly right. That was the original home. Yes. And so if you have someone who's focused on that detail, um, who has to now build a bare bones house, it's going to be the most unique um, bare bones house, but with some style and some uniqueness. So I think that is what he put into the house. And it's also the function, you know, you, you know, form follows function. And for him, it was form follows function for all this family. 
because he needed, um, you know, he had only a certain amount of space. He couldn't build up towards the street. He had to build up. He had to keep the house from swaying too great. So he put uh, steel sway cables on it. He didn't want his wife going out in the rain. So he had a compartment for the mail and he had to use the ceiling for storage. So it really was his practicality. I think also the era where he was, he was in the year of the depression, the, the times of the depression. And that's when a lot of salvage uh, materials were reused. We can think of a, you know, the collection of the rubber and, and all the things that we had to reuse during the depression, depression years. So I think he was a man of his times, a practical man, an architect in his brain, uh, and a, a fabulous carpenter who could, who could do all those things and build a house. He was one of the fortunate things. Many, many people lost their home in the depression, but not many could build a home where they could have shelter over their head. So this is a, a perfect segue to our Q and A se uh, session. Yeah, we have about ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we have a, a question from our audience um, for Julie. Uh, why are there two doors? <laughs> Why are there two front doors? <laughs> the one front door leads straight to the living room. Definitely the front door with the lace curtains. And the other <laughs> uh, uh, front door is the entrance to the cellar. Oh. Uh, yeah. And in the cellar, there was a pot belly stove that burned all the time. My grandmother kept it going to have a low constant heat in the cellar um, to keep the cellar dry. So now that explains why, you know, she wouldn't come to Baltimore to see us very often because she had to get back to her, her, her you know, her coal stove in the basement. Um, and Ooh, so- did I, did I see somewhere that this was built on low-lying land? Which that's would, exactly, low tidal <laughs> basin yeah. near quarry. So there's a huge boulder in the basement that my grandfather said, well, I can't blast it. I'm going around it, but it will be the rock of Gibraltar for this family. And it and really was. So that's what I mean that he was, you know, had to think outside of the box and had to think inside the box, uh, literally with what he had. And that was the state. Those were the rules of the game. You deal with what you have, you build with what you have, but you do the best with what you have. Yeah. All right. We have another question. Uh, this one's for Alalia. Uh, you mentioned, uh, this from Will Reynolds, you mentioned the Madam C.J. Walker site in Indiana, but to what extent is there coordination with the uh, Madam C.J. Walker site in Richmond, Virginia? So the, the Walker house in Richmond, Virginia is actually owned by Maggie Walker, ah. not Madam Walker, but Maggie Walker was the first woman uh, bank president. So an entirely different person, contemporaries, but not uh, but not connected by family. They just both married men who were named Walker. <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. And we have another question about the skinny house and how many rooms are in the skinny house? Well, it's a three-story um, house and it is a, for a single family. And the first floor incorporates a kitchen and living room. The second floor incorporates a, a a tiny bathroom and a bedroom and the third floor incorporates another bedroom so uh it it handled a, a family of three you know two adult a, a family of four sorry two kids and two adults i've, I've got one for Alilia of, of about design how much do you suppose madam walker bossed around vertna tandy in his design of the house, did, or did he design a house for her that he thought she might want? You know, I think it was probably the latter. I do have the correspondence where her daughter and, and to some degree is talking to their attorney and where Madam Walker is talking to their attorney about Tandy coming out and things that they like and they don't like about what he's doing. But I think he was very much trying to present to her the kind of house that a person of her stature would have. Um, but she wanted something that was manageable. It, it wasn't to be the scale when you go inside, as you know, it feels very comfortable. It doesn't feel like a massive cavernous place. Her bedroom has a sleeping porch and, and on the left side and on the right side, her daughter's bedroom also has a sleeping porch. I think that's something that she would have wanted. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
Yeah, I mean, in the Skinny House, I'm I'm so impressed by the way that Mr. Seeley took advantage of every inch and did, you know, things that are really smart, like the potbelly stove in the basement. Um, that, uh, I just think that's so impressive. What, what was his training? Where did he get his training? I was not able to find that out. Um, I, I, I don't know. I do know he was a carpenter's apprentice. He uh, was born in Orange County, um, uh, New York, and um, I knew he took a night class. So I'm still trying to figure that out, where those specific, that, that instruction came from. But he studied everything. You know, he, was, he uh, taught himself Italian um, to talk with his neighbors. Um, he was ambidextrous. He always had a book in his hand. He listened to opera. Um, my grandmother taught the kids musical instruments, violin, piano, opera. So he definitely, you know, um, was an educated man, a self-educated man. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but, and that's why he thought his son should stay and build houses with him. But my father had in mind to, to get a real college education and head to a historically black college. So I did see that father son, you know, dynamic going on. And like every father and son, father and daughter, different generations want different ways to learn. But he, 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 he sent away for correspondence courses, which were in the popular mechanics magazines. So he was a self-taught man and my father as well. That's the same for Madam Walker, right? She was self-taught? Right, she was self-taught. She, you know, after she started to make money, she hired um, the, ma the manager of her factory was a woman who'd been Dean of Girls at a, a black boarding school. So she surrounded herself with people from whom she could learn. All right, we have, we have time for, for one or two more questions quickly. Uh, well, somebody asked uh, whether Madam Walker lived in Villa Loro full time or did she you know, move seasonally to other residences? Right. You know, she, she uh, moved in in May of 1918 and died there in May of 1919. So it was a full time residence. Her daughter used it mostly for weekends. So she, she would go for weekend parties. So um, yes, and for her, it was she, the house in, in Harlem was her house most of the time. And then Alilia Walker also had a pied a terre on, at AD Edgecombe. So she had three homes during her lifetime. Oh, okay. All right. And, and, of, course, <laughs> and, and of course, everybody's curious about, about homes opening up for tours in the future, whether or not anyone knows anything about, about you know, certainly uh, they're, they're both private homes now, but um, what, what do you think are the chances, you know, post COVID that either of them would, would be open, like open days conservancy type, you know, tours? So, so Villa Lawara, when the Dolies owned the house in 1998, it was a, a United Negro College Fund designer show house. And it, thousands of people came through the house during that period of time. I think the village of Irvington really does not want huge numbers of people coming to the house. But the, but the uh, foundation, the Madam Walker Foundation uh, that was created by the Dennis family uh, is interested in making sure that the house is part of an overall um, push that they have for women of color entrepreneurs. So, so that it could, will be um, a place where people who go through the New Voices Fund will be able to visit. You know, I cannot speak for them because it is a, it is a complicated thing to open up a house, but it is the kind of place that, you know, once or twice a year that you would want to be able to allow people to come visit, but I, it's not gonna be a house museum. Right, right. Well, I, I think we're, we're gonna wrap things up now. Um, we wanna thank you both so much for joining us for this conversation. And it was really, really, really fun. And this is something that we, we do. We have more events to come. Um, and for people who were, were interested, we also have more uh, photos to come at the end of this program. Sort of like, you know, when you stick around for the, the outtakes after the movie. <laughs> um, and we also want to mention that both Julie and Alelia have, um, have books um, that are really, you know, 
everyone should should purchase one and and, and read it um, at their fate and support their local books. You know, that that's really really. Are there other things that you would like to add? Uh, I will just say uh, my website is uh, aleliabundles.com and we and also madamcjwalker.com so people can find updates and information about Madam Walker there. And I would like to say, um, you know, thank you to everyone um, in the preservation um, community welcoming me. I am thrilled to be here. Um, I have a website, skinnyhouse.org, and um, I will say that my door is always open. Um, I love sharing this story. It, you know, it, it keeps me inspired no matter what the events are. I can always turn to the story uh, about, um, you know, an ordinary family who wanted to do extraordinary things. So um, thank you so much. I think that probably concludes our evening. I really do want to thank Suzanne and our two panelists. Are you panelists? No, you're not panelists. You're two presenters. Yes. <laughs> for telling us the stories of these two places. It's, it's amazing, I think, how much commonality there is between the stories of two such different places. I can't, it's hard to think of two more different residences than, than the Skinny House and Villa Loire. I mean, look at them. And yet, you know, the thinking behind them, the issues confronted by people like Julia and, Julia and Alilia, who are trying to protect them and save them, um, they're strikingly similar. And I think that they're, the value of them sort of inspirationally to the African American community and beyond is incalculable. So thank the two of you so much for everything that you've done um, to save these places and make them make the public aware of them. I just think it's remarkable. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, again, Suzanne and Thomas for co-chairing the Excelsior Society and dreaming up these programs. And I hope you continue, everyone who's watching, to join us. So have a lovely evening. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see you all. Good night. And, and stay, stay tuned for some more slides. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. It was terrific. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.